Chapter Twenty of The Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. THE TERRORS OF POLITICS There is a good deal to be said for Mr. Lloyd George's complaint against the world for its treatment of politicians. In one sense, it may be better to throw a brick at a politician than to trust him. It encourages the others. Unhappily, it is a habit that, once acquired, is by no means easy to discontinue one throws one's first brick as a public duty before one has got through one's first cartload however one is throwing for the sheer exhilaration of the thing it is difficult for instance to believe that if mr leo max went to paradise itself he would be able to forget his cunning with the words swindlers rogues and cabals one feels sure that he would discover some angels requiring to be denounced for singing cocoa hymns and some committee of the saints which it was necessary to arraign as foozel and company the popularity of mr max's redundant abuse in the national review seems to me to be one of the most significant phenomena of the day it is a symptom of the reviving taste for looking on one's political opponent not only as a public but as a private villain there was probably never a time when it was a more popular amusement both in print and at the dinner table to give a twist of criminality to the portraiture of political enemies when daniel o'connell denounced disraeli as quote, the heir at law of the blasphemous thief who died on the cross end quote. he was abusing him not for his home life but as a public figure similarly when Sir William Harcourt described Mr. Chamberlain as quote, a serpent gnawing a file, end quote. he said nothing with which would make even the most proper lady shrink from bowing to Mr. Chamberlain in the street. The modern sort of nomenclature, however, has gone beyond this. It is a constant suggestion that cabinets are recruited from Pentonville and Wormwood scrubs. One would hardly be surprised on meeting a prime minister nowadays to find that he had the bristly chin and the club of bill sykes as for the rank and file of ministers one does not insult bill sykes by comparing them to him one thinks of them rather as on the level with the racecourse sneak thieves and the bullies of disorderly houses decidedly they are not persons to take tea with calumny of course is as old as adam or at least as joseph and one remembers that even mr gladstone was accused of the vulgarest immorality till a journalist tracked him down and discovered that it was rescue work and not the deadly sin with the largest circulation which was his private hobby that sort of libel no man can escape who risks remaining alive perhaps we should come to hate our public men as the athenians came to hate aristides if we could find nothing evil to think about them what the politician of the present day has to fear is not an occasional high tide of calumny or even a volley of the old-fashioned abusive epithets which are so to speak all in the day's play it is rather the million-eyed beast of suspicion which democracies every now and then take to their bosoms as a pet often it seems a noble beast for it is impossible to be suspicious all the time without sometimes suspecting the truth its food however is neither primarily truth nor primarily falsehood it thrives on both indifferently and one foresees that during the transition stage between the break-up of the old manners of servility and the inauguration of the new manners of service this beast is going to be more voracious than ever this may from some points of view be a good thing it will be an announcement at least of new forces struggling to become politically articulate on the other hand from the politician's point of view 
it will be not only deplorable but terrifying it will be worse than having to fight wild beasts in the arena politics it is safe to prophesy will before long call for as cool a nerve as determined a heroism as aviation it may be that things have always been like this that base motives have been imputed to politicians ever since politics began that one's political enemies always charged one with a dishonest greed for the spoils of office and all the rest of it but the terror of the politics of the future is likely to be not that one will be abused by one's enemies but that one will be abused by one's friends that is the tendency in a democracy which has not yet found itself it is a tendency which one sees occasionally at work to-day at labor conventions the unofficial leaders denounce the official leaders the official leaders retort in kind and the hosts of labor set out to face the enemy tugging at each other's ears there is no job on earth less enviable than the job of a labor leader the tory and radical leaders are supported at least in public by their respective parties but the later leader at home among his followers is commonly regarded as a cross between a skunk and a whited sepulchre as a rule it may be he deserves all he gets but the point is that he would get it just the same whether he deserves it or not the light that beats upon a labor mp's seat on the platform is a thousand times fiercer and more devouring than any that ever beat upon a throne this partly arises from the fact that the working classes are less practiced than others in concealing what passes through their minds if they suspect the worst they say so instead of passing a vote of thanks to the object of their suspicions further they are still fresh enough to politics to be very exacting in their demands upon politicians other people have got accustomed to the idea that lawyers whether liberal or tory do not go into the house of commons as the americans say for their health they have settled down comfortably to regard politics as a field of personal ambition even more than a field of public service no doubt the two aims are to a great extent compatible but even so no one expects the ordinary party politician to have the faith that goes to the stake for a conviction labor on the other hand in so far as it is articulate does demand faith of this kind from its leaders if they do not possess it already it is prepared to thump it into them with a big stick the difficulty is to retain this faith after one has been as it were inside politics one goes into politics believing in the faith that will remove mountains one remains in politics believing in the machine that will remove molehills it is only the rare politician who does not ultimately succumb to the fatal fascination of the machine it may be the party machine or the parliamentary machine or the administrative machine in any case and to whatever party he belongs he soon comes to take it for granted not that the machine must be made to do what the people want but that the people must learn to be patient even to the point of reverence with the machine and must be careful to keep it supplied not with the vinegar of criticism but with the oil of agreement which alone enables its wheels to run smoothly democracy has again and again had to rise up and smash its machines just because they have become idols in this way no doubt even were socialism in full swing the idolatry of machinery would still to some extent continue and new machines would constantly have to be invented to take the place of the old as soon as the latter began to acquire the pseudo-religious sanction there will probably still also be people who will go about wanting to destroy machinery from a rather illogical idea that anything which is even capable of being turned into an idol must be evil the politicians and the anti-politicians will always stand to each other in the relation of priests and iconoclasts quote, priests of machinery end quote, indeed would be a much more realistic description of most politicians from mr lloyd george's phrase quote, priests of humanity end quote. there you have the politician's doom there you have the real terror for the good man going into politics he dreads not that he will be called names so much as that he will deserve them office he knows is as perilous a gift as riches 
and the temptation to be a tyrant if it is only in a committee room down a side street has destroyed men who stood out like heroes against drink and the flesh and gold the house of commons could easily drift into becoming the house of the six hundred tyrants if only the public would permit it there is no amulet against the despotism of politicians except living opinions among the people it would be foolish however merely because politicians are in danger of setting themselves up as tyrants to propose to exterminate them they can if taken in time and domesticated be made at least as useful as a horse and the cow indeed so long as they are content to be regarded merely as our poor brothers they can be as useful as any other human beings almost except the saints but they must demand no sacrosanctity for their position at present when they denounce people for abusing them they are as often as not angry merely at being criticized they are too fond of thinking that it is the chief function of the electors to pass votes of confidence in them that is why heartily as i love politicians i would keep them on a chain but i would not throw stones at them in their misery i would even feed the brutes end of chapter twenty recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter twenty one of the book of this and that this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the book of this and that by robert lind on disasters it is a remarkable thing that human beings have never yet got reconciled to disaster each new disaster like the ship on fire the burning mine and the wrecked train inspire us with a new horror as though it were something without precedent occasionally in the history of the world horror has been heaped on horror till people become indifferent during the reign of terror for instance the tragic death of a man or woman became so every day an affair that before long it was regarded with almost as little emotion as a stumble on the stairs luckily the periods are rare in which this terrible indifference is possible to us it is only by keeping our sense of disaster sharp and burnished that we shall ever succeed in stirring ourselves into action against it on the other hand it is amazing for how brief a period the impulse to action in most of us lasts on the morrow of a great preventable disaster it is as if the whole human race stood up with bared heads and swore in the presence of heaven that this abominable thing should never be allowed to occur again but alas a full meal and a bottle of wine do wonders in restoring the rosy view of life our tears which at first seem to flow from the depths of our hearts soon give place to commonplaces of the lips and to sighs that actually increase our sense of comfort rather than otherwise we who but yesterday realized that trusting to luck was a crime far deadlier in its effects than a mere passionate murder will to-morrow accommodate ourselves once more to the accidental medley of life which at least justified itself in letting so many of our fathers and grandfathers die in their beds this accommodation of ourselves to life it is curious to reflect is just the consenting to drift without a star which is condemned by all the religions life is conceived in the religions as a vigilance if we are not vigilant we are damned it is the same in politics where we all quote burke's sentence about eternal vigilance being the price of liberty but religion and politics do not long survive the desert we are as much in love with drowsiness as the lotus eaters and at a seemingly safe distance we are as careless of the ruin of the skies as horace's just man 
preachers may tell us once a week that we are sentinels sleeping at our posts and if they say it eloquently enough we may possibly raise their salaries but we have got used to sleeping at our posts and what we have got used to we feel in our bones cannot be regarded as a very serious sin once in the fine wakefulness of our youth we summon the world out of its sleep but our voices sounded so thin and lonely in the sleep-laden air that we felt rather ashamed of ourselves and we soon climbed down out of our golden balconies and took our places with our brothers among the hosts of slumber upon our slumber no doubt there still breaks the occasional voice of a prophet who persists who bids us arise and get ready for the battle or flee from the wrath to come or do anything indeed except acquiesce with a sleepy grunt in the despotism of disaster it is to fight against disaster and destruction that we were born our prophets are those who put wakeful hearts in us for the conflict there should perhaps be no prophet needed to belabor us unto making an end of such disasters as have recently taken place in so far as they are preventable even our common sense it might be thought would be strong enough to insist upon the ordinary rules of caution being observed in ships and railways and though most of us are in little danger of dying in a pit explosion even in coal mines sometimes when i read the evidence of the cause of a railway disaster and find a managing director or someone else in authority confessing without repentance that his committee for one reason or another ignored the recommendations made by the board of trade for the general safety i marvel that the public never rise up and demand that a railway director shall be hanged i have small belief in capital punishment but if capital punishment must still be permitted in order to add a spice to the lives of newspaper readers then i should confine it to railway directors and other magnates who though they never commit a murder privately for the delight of the thing still run a system of murder far more sensational in results than any that was ever planned by french motor bandits think of all the railway accidents of recent times the accidents of every day to the men on the line and the accidents of red-letter days to us of the general public there have been so many of these lately that even the most stupid devotees of private ownership are beginning to think that somebody must be responsible and if somebody is responsible then in a society which resorts to penal measures somebody deserves punishment it is ridiculous to send weak-minded women to jail for borrowing knick-knacks off a shop counter while you send strong-minded railway directors to Bulgravia and Mayfair for maintaining a system of sudden death for workmen and travellers. In the days of the Irish famine, coroner's juries, whose business it was to report on the death of some starved man, used to bring in a verdict of willful murder against Lord John Russell. Is there no coroner's jury of the present day to bring in an occasional verdict of willful murder against the directors of a railway or a factory? when we see a railway manager sentenced to seven years penal servitude as the reasonable consequence of some disaster on the line i have an idea that the number of railway accidents will diminish when we see the directors of a shipping company fined a year's income and a captain dismissed from his post for sending a ship full steam ahead through the fog we shall be thrilled by fewer accidents at sea but it is the old story one's crime has only to be on a sufficiently grand scale to be as far above punishment as an act of god what punishment can be too severe for a half-witted farmhand who burns his master's haystack but as for the railway lords who burn a score of men women and children in the course of a railway smash by their carefully calculated carelessness why one might as well call down punishment on a thunderstorm it pleases our indolent brains to regard accidents associated with dividends as the works of an inscrutable providence it is not enough that providence should be the author at least passively of earthquakes and gales and tidal waves he must also be held accountable for every breakage of bones that occurs as the result of our passion for saving money rather than life some day i hope the distinction between providence and the capitalist will be a little clearer than it at present is. 
the confusion between the two has hitherto led to the capitalists being invested with a sacrosanctity to which we offer up human sacrifices on a scale far surpassing anything ever known in peru or in the dark places of africa it would be folly however to prophesy a world from which disaster had disappeared on the heels of the mastodon one can do little more than regulate disaster we already regulate death by offering a strong discouragement to murder pessimists may contend that in a world where so many deaths are taking place as it is one or two more or less can hardly matter but all the advances that the human race has ever made have only been an affair of one or two the distribution of one or two women of one or two privileges of one or two pennies consequently even in a world where disasters grow as thick as trees we are bound to fight them so far as they can be fought if we do not the wilderness will swallow us one is usually consoled by the leader writers after a disaster has taken place by the reflection that it has taught us certain lessons that will never never be forgotten unfortunately we know the lessons already we do not want to be taught our a b c over again by having the alphabet burned into our flesh with a red-hot iron at the same time the leader writers do well in trying to arrive at some philosophy of disaster but the true philosophy of disaster is one which will teach us to rage where raging will be of avail and to endure where there is nothing for it but endurance most of us in these days are content to have no philosophy at all philosophy being a name for serious thought about the universal disaster of death to read montaigne who lived blithely in conversation with death is to step right out of our modern civilization into a wiser world is to become an inhabitant of the universe instead of a rather inefficient earner of an income montaigne tells us that even when he was in good health if a thought occurred to him during a walk he jotted it down at once for fear he might be dead before he could reach home and write it down at leisure he made himself as familiar with death as he was with the sun or his neighbors he explains what a happiness it would have been to him to write a history of the way in which different great men had died and his essays are in great part an expression of interest in the caprices of death among the heroes of the human race history was to him a procession of disasters disasters however seen against the background of faith in the benevolence of the scheme of things and he made his account with life as something to be enjoyed as a privilege rather than a right Quote, if a man could by any means avoid it he said of death though by creeping under a calf's skin i am one that should not be ashamed of the shift End quote. somehow one hardly believes him he seems here to be speaking for our reassurance rather than historically on the other hand he is right a thousand times in summoning even the most timid need to go out and shake hands with disaster as with a friend to hide from it is only a kind of watered-down atheism it is a distrust of life it is easy of course to compose sentences on the subject it is quite another thing to compose ourselves matthew arnold relates in one of his prefaces how he once failed to bring any consolation to the occupants of a railway carriage at a time when a panic about murder in railway trains was running its course by bidding them reflect that even if any of them died suddenly by violent hands the gravel walks of their villas would still be rolled and there would still be a crowd at the corner of fenchurch street it is a very rational mind that can get comfort out of a thought like that even when we are not troubled by thinking of our work or our family we cannot but cry out against the corruption of this flesh of our bodies and many of us quake at the thought of the enforced adventure of the soul into a secret world marked down for disaster we may add to our income or win a place in the cabinet or make a reputation for singing comic songs but death will steal upon us in our security and strip us bare of everything save the courage we have learned from philosophy and the faith that has been given us by religion we spend our hours shirking that fact cowardice and pessimism will avail on our deathbeds no more than wealth or stuffed birds of paradise logically then 
every circumstance shouts to us to be brave but alas bravery though in face of the disasters of others it is easy enough in the face of our own disasters is a rare and splendid form of genius to attain it is the crown of existence End of chapter 21 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 22 of the Book of This and That This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the Book of This and That by Robert Lind Chapter 22 The Rights of Murder Mr. Justice Darling, before passing a sentence of seven years' penal servitude on Julia Decies for wounding her lover with intent to kill him, made a remark which must interest all students of the morals of murder. No one, probably, he declared, would very much lament the wounded man but that was not the question so far as one can gather from the scrappy reports in the newspapers the crime was in the main a crime of jealousy the man and woman had lived together for some years had then separated had come back to each other and had finally quarrelled as the result of a suggestion that he had taken up with some other woman with whom he was going to paris incidentally it was stated that the man had given Julia Decies five hundred pounds and some furniture in the previous October on the understanding that she was to trouble him no further. It was also stated that the prosecutor had infected the woman with a terrible disease and that she was pregnant. There you have a story of contemporary life as mean in its horror as any that Gorky has written. It is a story in which the only conceivably beautiful element is the insurgent anger of the woman. It is a tragedy not of heroic suffering, but of the dull slums of human nature. Probably in any country where they managed things according to rough justice, instead of with judges and juries, no one would have blamed Julia Decies, even to the extent of a day's imprisonment, for seeking to avenge herself in the most extreme form on an environment so intolerable on a man whom, in the judge's phrase, no one probably would very much lament. There is a mining camp logic which holds that if a man is not worth lamenting, one need not be greatly concerned whether he is alive or dead. Civilization, however, speaking from under the wig of Mr. Justice Darling, says of even the most worthless of its human products, he was a person whose life was entitled to the protection of the law as though he were a person with the best of characters. To the moralist of the mining camp, this would seem like saying that the weeds have as good a right to exist as the flowers. It is obviously one of the earliest instincts of man to get rid of his rivals by killing them. Cain was representative of the human race at this barbarous stage. It is the stage of unhampered egoism, of laissez-faire, applied to morals. Poets, who sometimes inherit this egoism, have written sympathetically of Cain. Now that the art is becoming deliberately primitive again, we may expect to see new statues to Cain insolently set up in the poet's back bedrooms. Civilization is, in one aspect, a war against Cain and the minor poets. It depends in its early stages on the suppression of the private right to murder, on the socialization, one may say, of the right to kill. No doubt, even in the most highly developed civilizations, the right to kill is still left to some extent in the hands of private individuals. One has the right to kill certain people in self-defense, but the more advanced civilization is, the more limited will that right be. So limited has it become in modern England that it has been maintained one is not even entitled to shoot a burglar, unless by running away, and in various other ways, one has first exhausted all the gentler devices for escaping injury at his hands. 
this may seem like a sad falling away from the dramatic virtues of the heroic age when one slung dead burglars round one's neck like a bag of game but the heroic age as has been pointed out was an age of egoists not of citizens when heroes evolved into citizens as we see in the history of athens the culminating triumph came with the abandonment of the right to kill as symbolized in the carrying of arms athens was the first city in greece in which the men went about unarmed that was a recognition of the fact that civilized man is not a killing animal to the greatest degree possible but only in the least degree possible it may be retorted on the other hand that murder was not condoned in the case either of Cain or of Orestes, and there are many other examples of guilty murderers in the heroic age. This, however, only means that there was some limitation put upon the right to kill from the beginning. The right to kill did not exist as against the members of one's own family. It would have been impossible to explain the humor of the playboy of the Western world to men of the heroic age the women who flocked with their farmhouse gifts to show their appreciation of the boy who had killed his father would have seemed long-nailed monsters of depravity to the greeks of the time of oedipus professor freud in his book on dreams maintains that men in all ages desire to kill their fathers out of jealousy he contends even that hamlet's reluctance to kill his father's murderer was due to the fact that he had often wished to murder his father himself. This, however, is an abnormal interpretation of the jealousies and hatreds of human beings. The philosopher, perhaps, may see the principle of murder in every feeling of anger in the same way as the Christian apostle saw that, if you hate a man, you are already a murderer in your own heart. The hatred of parents and children, however, is not universal any more than the hatred of husbands and wives. Still, family quarrels are sufficiently natural to enable us to see that the first step toward good citizenship must have been the prohibition of the right to kill the members of one's own family. Gradually, the family widened into the clan, the clan into the city, the city into the nation, the nation into the larger unit embracing men of the same color, and it will ultimately widen, one hopes, into the human race. But we are far from having reached that stage yet. It is said to be almost impossible to get a death sentence passed on an Englishman who has murdered an Indian native. This merely means that it is regarded as a lesser crime for a European to murder an Asiatic than for a European to murder a European. In other words, the family sanctities have been extended in some respects so as to cover Europe, but they have not yet overflowed so far as Asia and Africa. The objection of the War at Any Price Party today to civil war is purely on the ground that it is fratricidal, that it is an outrage on recognized family sanctities. The militarists do not see that every war is fratricidal, that every war is a civil war. As a rule, indeed, they deny the existence of family rights outside the borders of their own nation in the narrowest sense. They do not realize that it is as horrible a thing to shoot fellow Europeans not to say fellow men, as it is to shoot fellow countrymen. As private citizens, they not only admit, but insist upon the foreigner's right to live. As public-minded men and patriots, they will admit nothing beyond his right to be carried off on a stretcher if they fail to kill him on the field of battle. This, however, is to discuss Cain as a statesman rather than Cain as a human being to consider the social right to kill rather than the individual right to kill public morals being so far in the rear of private morals it raises an entirely different question from that suggested by mr justice darling's remark mr justice darling laid it down that the private citizen has not except it may be presumed in the last necessities of self-defense the right to kill even the most worthless and treacherous of human beings the spy the sweater the rack-renter the ravisher 
each has the right to trial by his peers this i believe is good morals as well as good law even where it is a case of a blackguard's commission of some unspeakable crime for which there is no legal redress though we may sympathize with his murderer we cannot praise the murder there are it may be admitted cases of murder with a high moral purpose these are especially abundant in the annals of political assassination which may be described as private murder for public reasons very few of us would claim to be the moral equals of charlotte corday and we have abased ourselves for centuries before the at last suspected figures of harmodius and aristogiton there are crimes which are the crimes of saints our reverence for the saintliness leads us almost into a reverence for the crime the hero of finland a few years ago was a young man who slew a russian tyrant at the expense of his own life deeds like this have the moral glow of self-sacrifice beyond one's own most daring attempts at virtue how then is one to condemn them but we condemn them by implication if we do not believe in imitating them and few of us would believe in imitating them to the point of bringing up our children to be even the most honorable of assassins one unconsciously analyzes these crimes into their elements some of them noble some of them the reverse one has heard again of what may be called private murders for family reasons crimes of revenge for some wrong done to a mother a sister or a child even here however one knows that it is against the interests of the state and of the race that we should admit the right to kill once allow crimes of indignation and every indignant man will claim to be a law to himself it may be that the prohibition of murder even murder with the best of intentions is in the interest of society rather than of any absolute code of morality but even so society must set up its own code of morality and self-defense in practice of course it has also the right to distinguish between crimes that are the outcome of a criminal nature and crimes that are isolated accidents in the lives of otherwise good men and women lombroso was opposed to the severe punishment of crimes of passion crimes which are not likely to be repeated by those who perpetrate them this however is a plea for the consideration of mitigating circumstances not an assertion that the crime of murder is in any circumstances justifiable end of chapter twenty two recording by tom daly chapter twenty three of the book of this and that this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. The Humor of Hoaxes. It was only the other day that mr g a birmingham gave us a play about a hoax at the expense of an irish village in course of which a statue was erected to an imaginary irish american general the aide-de-camp of the lord lieutenant coming down from dublin to perform the unveiling ceremony lady gregory it may be remembered had previously used a similar theme in the image and now comes the story of yet another statue hoax from paris on the whole the paris joke is the best of the three it was a stroke of genius to invent a great educationist called hegesepi simon one can hardly blame the members of the chamber of deputies for falling to the lore of a name like that perhaps they should have been warned by the motto which m paul Barot of Le Clair, the perpetrator of the hoax quoted from among the sayings of the precursor to whom he wished to erect a centenary statue quote, the darkness vanishes when the sun rises end quote, is an aphorism which is almost too good to be true 
when sir burrell however relying upon the innocence of human nature sent a circular to a number of senators and deputies opposed to him in politics announcing that quote, thanks to the liberality of a generous donor the disciples of hegesepi simon have been able to collect the funds necessary for the erection of a monument which will rescue the precursor's memory from oblivion end quote, and inviting them to become honorary members of a committee to celebrate the event despite the fact that he quoted the sentence about the darkness and the sunrise thirty of the politicians replied that they would be delighted to help in the centenary rejoicings monsieur barot thereupon published their names with the story of the hoax he had practised on them and as a result according to the newspaper correspondence all paris has been laughing at the joke quote, the good taste of which adds one of them would hardly be relished in england where other political manners obtain End quote. with all respect to this patriotic journalist i am afraid the love of hoaxing and practical joking cannot be limited to the latin or even to the continental races it is a passion that is as universal as lying and a good deal older than drinking it is merely the instinct for lying indeed turned to comic account christianity unable to suppress it entirely had to come to terms with it and as a result we have one day of the year the first of april devoted to the humours of this popular sin there are many explanations of the origin of all fools day one of which is that it is a fragmentary memorial of the mock trial of jesus and another of which refers it to the belief that it was on the first of april that noah sent out the dove from the ark but the christian or hebrew origin of the festival appears to be unlikely in view of the fact that the hindus have an all fools day of their own the huli festival on almost exactly the same date one may take it that it was in origin simply a great natural holiday on which men enjoyed the license of lying as they enjoyed the license of drinking on a bank holiday there is no other sport for which humanity would be more likely to desire the occasional sanction of church and state than the sport of making fools of our neighbors we must have fools if we cannot have heroes some people who are enthusiasts for destruction indeed would give us fools and knaves in the place of our heroes and have even an idea that they would be serving some moral end in doing so it is on an iconoclastic eagerness of one kind or another that nearly all hoaxing and practical joking is based it consists chiefly in taking somebody down a peg the boy who used to shout woof however may have been merely an excessively artistic youth who enjoyed watching the varied expressions on the faces of the sweating and disillusioned passers-by who ran to his assistance obviously a man's face is a dozen times more interesting to look at when it is crimson with frustrate virtue than when it is placid with thoughts of the price of pigs this is not to justify the morality of hoaxing it is to explain it as an art for art's sake murder can and has been defended on the same grounds it has to be feared however that few hoaxers or murderers can be named to pursue their hobby in the disinterested spirit of artists in most cases there is some motive of cruelty or dislike one would not go to the trouble of murdering and hoaxing people if it did not hurt or vex somebody or other those who invent hoaxes are first cousins of the boy who ties kettles or lighted torches the cat's tails it is the terror of the cat that amuses him if the cat purred as the instruments of torture were fitted on it the boy would feel that he had serious cause for complaint there is no doubt a great deal of the cruelty of boys which is experimental rather than malicious practice of blowing up frogs for instance but for most part it must be admitted a spice of cruelty is counted a gain in human amusements this is called thoughtlessness in boys but it is a deliberate enthusiasm in primitive man out of which we have to be slowly civilized there is probably no more popular game with the infancy of the streets than covering a brick with an old hat in the hope that some glorious fool will come along who will kick hat and brick together and go limping and swearing on his way one might easily produce a host of similar instances of the humour of the small boy who looks so like an angel 
and behaves so like a devil there are it may be thousands of small boys who never perpetrated an act of such cheerful malice in their lives but even they have usually some other outlet for their comic cruelty the half of comic literature depends upon someone's getting cudgelled or ducked in a well or subjected to some pain it is one of the paradoxes of comedy indeed that even when we like the hero of it we also like to see him hurt and humiliated we are glad when don quixote is beaten to a jelly and when his teeth are knocked down his throat we rejoice at every discomfort that befalls poor parson adams humor even when it reaches the pitch of genius has still about it much of the elemental cruelty of the boys who arranges a pin upon the point of which his friend may sit down or who pulls away a chair and sends someone sprawling hoaxes at the best spring from a desire to harry one's neighbor as a rule refined men and women have by this time given up the ambition to cause others physical pain but one still hears of milder annoyances being practised with considerable spirit it was theodore hook i believe who originated the practice of hoaxing tradesmen into delivering long caravans of goods at some house or other to the fury of the householder and the disturbance of traffic every now and then the jest is still revived whereupon everybody condemns it and laughs at it that is one of the oddest facts about the hoax as a form of humour no one has a good word to say for it and yet everyone who tells the story of a hoax tells it with a chuckle some years ago a young gentleman from one of the universities palmed himself off on an admiral was it not as the sultan of zanzibar and was entertained as such by the officers on board one of king george's ships everybody frowned at the young gentleman's taste but nobody outside the navy failed to enjoy the hoax as the best item of the day's news similarly the Copenhagen affair set not only all germany but all europe laughing skill and audacity always delight us for their own sakes when it is rogueries that are skilful and audacious they shock us into malicious appreciation they are adventures standing on their heads it is difficult not to forgive a clever impostor so long as it is not we on whom he has imposed as for the hegesippia hoax it may be that there is even an ethical element in our pleasure such a hoax as this is a pin stuck in pretentiousness if it is an imposture it is an imposture on impostors one feels that it is good that members of parliament should be exposed from time to time otherwise they might be puffed up still there remains a very good reason why we should oppose a disapproving front to hoaxes of all sorts we ourselves may be the next victims most of us have a hegesepi simon in our cupboards whether in literature history or politics the human animal is much given to pretending to knowledge that he does not possess there are some men whom one could inveigle quite easily into a discussion on plays of shakespeare and euripides which were never written i remember how one evening two students concocted a poem beginning with the driveling line quote, i stood upon the rolling of the years end quote, and foisted it on a noisy admirer of keats as a work of the master similarly in political arguments one has known a man to invent sayings of gladstone and chamberlain without being challenged this is of course not amusing in itself it becomes amusing only when the other disputants instead of confessing their ignorance make a pretense of being acquainted with the invented quotations it is our dread of appearing ignorant that leads us into the enactment of this kind of lies we will go to any extreme rather than confess that we have never even heard of hegesippi simon luckily hegesippi simon happens to be a person who can trip our pretentiousness up but the senators and deputies who were willing to celebrate the precursor centenary were probably not humbugs to any greater degree than if they had consented to celebrate the anniversary of diderot or rousseau or alfred de musset it is utter imposture this practice of doing honour to great names which mean less to one than a lump of sugar and if an end could be put to centenary celebrations in all countries no great harm would be done to public honesty on the other hand most public rejoicings over men of genius would be exceedingly small if all the speeches and applause had to come from the heart 
without any addition from those who merely like to be in the latest movement perhaps the adherents of hegesepi simon are necessary in order to make it profitable to be a man of genius at all they are not only a useful clack but they pay that is why even if william shakespeare anatoly france and bergson are only other and better known names for hegesepi it would be madness to destroy such enthusiasm as is gathered around them monsieur burrell by his light-hearted hoax on his political opponents has struck at the very roots of popular homage to men of genius End of chapter twenty three recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter Twenty Four of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. Chapter Twenty Four Anatole France. There does not at first glance seem to be any great similarity between Mr. Thomas Hardy and Monsieur Anatole France, the latter of whom has come to London to see how enthusiastically Englishmen can dine when they wish to express their feelings about literature. Yet both writers are extraordinarily alike. Each of them is an incarnation of the spirit of pity, of the spirit of irony. Mr. Hardy may have more pity than irony, and Anatole France may have more irony than pity. I might put it another way, and say that Mr. Hardy has the tragic spirit of pity, while Anatole France has the comic spirit of pity, but each of them is, in his own way, the last word of the nineteenth century on the universe, the century that extinguished the noon of faith and gave us the little star of pity to light up the darkness instead. Each of them is, therefore, a pessimist, Mr. Hardy, typically British, Anatole France, typically French, in his distress. It is as though Mr. Hardy spoke out of a rain cloud, Anatole France out of a cloud of irresponsible lightnings. There, perhaps, you have an eternal symbol of the difference between the Englishman, who takes his irreligion as seriously as his religion, and the Frenchman, who takes his irreligion as smilingly as his aperitif. It is just because he sums up the end of the nineteenth century so well that Anatole France is already in some quarters a declining fashion. He is the victim of a reaction against his century, not of a reaction against his style. He is the last of the true mockers. The twentieth century demands that even its mockers shall be partisans of the coming race. Anatole France does not believe in the coming race he is willing to join a society for bringing it into existence he is even a socialist but his vision of the world shows him no prospect of utopias he is as sure as the writer of ecclesiastes that every blessed or rather cursed thing is going to happen over and over again life is mainly a procession of absurdities in which lovers and theologians and philosophers and collectors of bric-a-brac are the most amusing figures it is one of the happy paradoxes of human conduct that in spite of this vision of utilities anatole france came forward at the dreyfus crisis as a man of action a man who believed that the procession of absurdities could be diverted into a juster road Suddenly, as Brandis has said, he stripped himself of all his skepticism and stood forth with Voltaire's old blade gleaming in his hand, like Voltaire irresistible by reason of his wit, like him the terrible enemy of the church, like him the champion of innocence. But taking a step in advance of Voltaire, France proclaimed himself the friend of the poor in the great political struggle. He even did his best to become a mob orator for his faith. Since that time he has given his name willingly to the cause of every oppressed class and nation. It is as though he had no hope and only an intermittent spark of faith, but his heart is full of charity. 
that somewhere or other a preacher lay hidden in Anatole France might have all along been suspected by observant readers of his works. He is a born fabulist. He drifts readily into fable in everything he writes, and if his fables do not always walk straight to their moral in their Sunday clothes, that is not because he is not a very earnest moralist at heart, but because his wit and humor continually entice him down bypaths. It is sometimes as though he set out to serve morality and ended up by telling an indecent story, as though he knelt down to pray and found himself addressing God in a series of blasphemies. This is the contradiction in his nature which makes him so ineffectual as a propagandist, so effectual as an artist. Ineffectual, one ought to say, perhaps, not as a propagandist, so much as a partisan, for he does propagate with the most infectious charm his view of the animal called man, and the need for being tender and not too serious in dealing with him. If he has not preached the brotherhood of man with the missionary fervor of the idealists, he has at least, in accordance with an idealism of his own, preached a brotherhood of the beasts. He never lets himself savagely loose upon his brother beasts as Swift does. Even in Penguin Island, with all its bitterness, he shakes his head rather than his stick at the vicious kennels of men. The truth is, Epicureanism is in his blood. If he could, he would watch the stream of circumstance as it went by with the appreciative indifference of the gods. It is only the preacher in his heart that prevents this. Like his own Abbe Coignard, he shares his loyalty between Epicurus and Christ. Henley once described Stevenson as something of the sensualist and something of the shorter catechist. Translated into French, that might serve as a character sketch of Anatole France. Originality has been denied to him in some quarters, but, it seems to me, unjustly. One may find something very like this or that aspect of him in Stern or Voltaire or Heine, but in none of them does one find the complete Anatole France, ironist, fabulist, critic, theologian, artist, connoisseur, politician, philosopher, and creator of character. As artist, he is at many points comparable to Stern. He has the same sentimental background to his wit, the same tenderness in his ridicule, the same incapacity for keeping his jests from scrambling about the very altar, the same almost Christian sensuality? Stern, of course, is the more innocent writer, because his intellect was not nearly so covetous of experience. Stern, though in his humanitarianism he occasionally stood in a pulpit above his time, was content for the most part to work as an artist. He could do all the preaching he wanted on Sundays, on weekdays, my Uncle Toby and Corporal Trim were the only minor prophets he troubled about. Anatole France, on the other hand, is not a preacher by trade. He has no safety valve of that kind for his moralizings. The consequence is that he has again and again felt himself compelled to ease his mind by adopting the part of the lay preacher we call the journalist. He is, in much of his work, a stern-turned-journalist, a stern, flashingly interested in leaving the world better than he found it, and other things that grieve the artistic. He might even be described as the greatest living journalist. The Bergeret series of novels are, apart from their artistic excellence, the most supremely delightful examples of modern European journalism. Similarly, when he turned for a too brief space to literary criticism, he proved himself the master of all living men in the art of the literary caserie. The four-volume La Vie Littéraire will, I imagine, survive all but a few of the literary essays of the nineteenth century. They are, in a sense, only trifles, but what irresistible trifles! But no criticism would be just which stopped short at the assertion that Anatole France is to some extent a journalist, so was Dickens for that matter, and so no doubt was Shakespeare. It is much more important to emphasize the fact that Anatole France is an artist, that he stands at the head of the artists of Europe, indeed, since Tolstoy died. 
His novels are not the issue of an impartial love of form like Flaubert's. They are as freakish as the author's personality. They tell only the most interrupted of stories. They might be said in many cases to introduce the Montaigne method into fiction. They are essays portraying a personality rather than novels on a conventional model. They may have a setting amid early Christianity or early medievalism. They may disguise themselves as realism or as fairy tales, but the secret passion of them all is the self-revelation of the author, the portraiture of the last of the mockers as he surveys this mouldy world of churches and courtesans. This portrait peeps round the corner at us in nearly every sentence. Milesian romancers, cries Monsieur Bézeret. O oh, shrewd Petronius, O oh, Noël de Faille, O oh, forerunners of Jean de La Fontaine, what apostle was wiser or better than you who are commonly called good-for-nothing rascals? O oh, benefactors of humanity, you have taught us the true science of life, the kindly scorn of the human race. There, by implication, you have the ideal portrait of Anatole France himself, the summary of his temper. The kindly scorn of the human race is the basis upon which the Francian Decalogue will be founded. In Penguin Island, the scorn at times ceases to be entirely kindly. It ceases even to be scorn. It becomes utter despair. But in Thais, in Sur la Pierre Blanche, in La Mannequin d'Osier, with what a comprehending sympathy he despises the human race, how amiably he impels the little creatures too and lectures us on the humours of amorousness and quarrelsomeness and heroism in the insect world even the french revolution he sees in les dieux en soif as a scuffle of insects to be regarded with amusement rather than amazement by the philosopher among his cardboard toys not really amusement of course but pity disguised as amusement the pity, too, not of a philosopher in a garden, but of a philosopher always curiously hesitating between the garden and the street. End of chapter 24 Read for you by Tom Daly Chapter 25 of The Book of This and That This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. It is only now and then, when some great disaster like the sinking of the Empress of Ireland occurs, that man recovers his ancient dread of the sea. We have grown comfortably intimate with the sea. We use it as a highway of business and pleasure, with as little hesitation as the land. The worst we fear from it is the discomfort of seasickness, and we are inclined to treat that half comically, like a boy's sickness from tobacco. There are still a few persons who are timid of it, as the more civilized among us are timid of force, but they cannot sleep if they are near its dull roar, and they hate, like nagging, the damnable iteration of its waves. For most of us, however, the sea is a domesticated winter. We pace its shores with as little nervousness as we walk past the bears and lions in the zoological gardens. With less nervousness, indeed, for we trust our bodies to the sea in little scoops of wood, and even fling ourselves half-naked into its waters as a luxury, an indulgence bolder than any we allow ourselves with the tamest lions. Let an accident occur, however, let a ship go down or a bather be carried out in the wash of the tide and something in our bones remembers the old fears of the monster in the waters we realize suddenly that we who trust the sea are like the people in other lands who live under the fiery mountains that have poured death on their ancestors time and again we are amazed at the faith of men who rebuild their homes under a volcano but the sea over which we pass with so smiling a certainty is more restless than a volcano and more clamorous for victims originally man seems to have dreaded all water 
whether of springs or of rivers or of the sea, in the idea that it was a dragon's pasture. There is no myth more universal than that of the beast that rises up out of the water and demands as tribute the fairest woman of the earth. Perseus rescued Andromeda from such a monster as this, and it is as the slayer of a water beast that St. George lives in legend. However, history may seek to degrade him into a dishonest meat contractor. Not that it was always a maiden who was sacrificed. Probably in the beginning the sea beast made no distinction of sex among its victims. In many of the legends we find it claiming men and women indifferently. In the story of Jonah it demands a male victim. And in many countries today there are men who will not rescue anyone from drowning on the ground that if you disappoint the sea of one victim it will sooner or later have you, whether you are male or female, for your pains. These men regard the sea as some men regard God a beneficent being if you get on the right side of it they see it as the home of one who is half divinity and half monster and who when once his passion for sacrifice has been satisfied will look on you with a shining face hence of all these gifts to it of handsome youths and well-born children hence the marriage to it of soothing maidens in the latter case no doubt there is also the idea of a magical marriage which will promote the fertility of water and land. Matthew Arnold's forsaken merman, if you let the anthropologist get hold of it, will be shown to be but the exquisite echo of some forgotten marriage of the sea. These superstitions may reasonably enough be considered as for the most part dramatizations of a sense of the sea's insecurity. We have ceased to believe in dragons and mermaids, chiefly because civilization has built up for us a false sense of security, and you can arrange in any of Cook's branch offices to spend your weekend silent upon a peak in Darien, commanding the best views of the Pacific. We have, as it were, advertised the sea till it seems as innocuous as a patent medicine. We no more expect to be injured by it than to be poisoned at our meals. We have lost both our fears and our wonders and as we glide through the miraculous places of ocean, we no longer listen for the song of the sirens, but sit down comfortably to read the latest issue of the Continental Edition of the Daily Mail. It is a question whether we have lost or gained more by our podgy indifference. Sometimes it seems as if there were a sentence of thou fool hanging over us as we lounge in our deck chairs. In any case, the men who were troubled by the fancy of Scylla and Charvitis and were conscious of the nearness of leviathan and saw without surprise the rising of islands of doom in the sunset went out none the less highly hearted for their fears we are sometimes inclined to think that no one ever quite enjoyed the wonders of the sea before the nineteenth century we have been brought up to believe that all the ancients regarded the sea with horus as a sailor's grave and that was the end of their emotions concerning it even in the eighteenth century it has been dinned into us men took so little impartial pleasure in the sea that a novel like roderick random though full of nautical adventures does not contain three sentences in praise of its beauty this has always seemed to me to be great nonsense no doubt men were not so much at their ease with the sea in the old days as they are now but be sure the terrors of the sea did not stun the ancients into indifference to its beauty any more than the terrors of tragedy stupefy you or me into insensitiveness. There is a sense of all the magnificence of the sea in the cry of Jonah. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down. To the bottom of the mountains there is perhaps more of awe than of the pleasure of the senses in this it is certainly nothing of the oh for the life of the sailor lad jollity of the ballad concert but then not even the most enthusiastic sea literature of this sea-ridden time has mr conrad who has found in the sea a new fatherland if the phrase is not too anomalous never approaches it in that mood of flirtation that we get in music-hall songs. 
he is as conscious of its dreadful mysteries as the author of the book of jonah and as aware of its terrors and portents as the mariners of the odyssey he discovers plenty of humor in the relations of human beings with the sea but this humor is the merest peering of stars in a night of tragic irony his ships crash through the tumult of the waves like creatures of doom even when they triumph as they do under the guidance of the brave his sea too is haunted by invisible terrors where more ancient sailors dreaded marvels that had shape and bulk mr macefield's love of the sea is to a still greater extent dominated by tragic shadows there are few gloomier poems in literature than dauber in spite of the philosophy and calm of its close it is only young men who have never gone farther over the water than for a sail to southland who think of the sea as consistently a merry place not that all sailors set out to sea in the mood of hamlet the praise of the sea life that we find in their chanties is the praise of cheerful men but it is also the praise of men who recognize the risks and treacheries that lurk under the ocean a place of perils as manifestly as any jungle in the literature of man's adventures and fears perhaps it is necessary that the average man should ignore this dreadful quality in the sea it would otherwise interfere too much with the commerce and the gaiety of nations and after all an ocean liner is from one point of view retreat from the greater dangers of the streets of london but the imaginative man cannot be content to regard the sea with this ignorant amiableness to him every voyage must still be a voyage into the unknown where tall ships founder and deep death waits he is no more impudently at home with the sea than was shakespeare who in full fathom five thy father lies wrote the most imaginative poem of the sea in literature even mr kipling who has slapped most of the old gods on the back and pressed penny union jacks into their hands writes of the sea as a strange world of fearful things when he makes the deep sea cables sing their songs of the english he aims at conveying the same sense of awe that we get when we read how jonah went down in the belly of the great fish recall how the song of the deep sea cable begins the wrecks dissolve above us their dust drops down from afar down to the dark to the utter dark where the blind white sea snakes are there is no sound no echo of sound in the deserts of the deep or the great gray level plains of ooze where the shell bird cables creep mr kipling's particularizations of the blind white sea snakes and the level plains of ooze achieve nothing of the majesty of the far simpler bottoms of the mountains in the song of jonah but when we get behind the more vulgar and prosaic phrasing we see that the mood of mr kipling and the hebrew author is essentially the same it is nevertheless man's constant dream that he will yet be able to defeat these terrors of the sea he sees himself with elation as the conqueror of storms and makes his plans to build a ship that no accident can sink either in a wild sea or a calm before the titanic went down many people thought that the great discovery had been made the titanic went forth like a boast and perished from one of the few accidents her builders had not provided against like a victim of nemesis in a greek story after that we ceased to believe in the unsinkable ship but we thought at least that if only ships were furnished with enough boats to hold every one on board no ship would ever again sink on a calm night carrying over a thousand human beings to the bottom yet the empress of ireland had apparently boats enough to save every passenger and now she has gone down with over a thousand dead in shallow water at the mouth of a river which the times insist is at least as safe for navigation as the english channel and much safer than the thames it is as though the great machines we have invented were not machines for safety but machines of destruction they have us in their grip as we thought we had the sea in ours they do but betray us indeed in a new manner into an ancient snare the snare of power that like leviathan esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood we must no doubt go on dreaming that we shall master the sea and that we shall do it with machines perfectly under our control but if we are wise we shall dream humbly and put off boasting until we are dead 
and quite sure that the triumph has been ours it would be inhuman i admit never to feel a thrill of satisfaction at man's plodding success in breaking the sea and the air to his uses in the discovery of fire in the converting of lightning into an illumination for nurseries but we still perish by fire and flood by wind and lightning we use them but it is at our peril it is as though we were favored strangers in the elements but assuredly we are not conquerors mr wells in the world set free makes one of his characters in the pride of human invention shake his fist at the sun and cry out i'll have you yet it would have seemed to the greeks blasphemy and it still seems folly for man a hairpin of flesh half hidden in trousers to talk so there is no victory that man has yet been able to achieve over matter that he does not before long discover has merely delivered him into a new servitude in the section twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. Chapter Twenty Six The Futurists. The appearance of the first number of Blast ought to put an end to the Futurist movement in England one can forgive a new movement for anything except being tedious blast is as tedious as an attempt to play pistol by someone who has no qualification for the part but whom neither friends nor the family clergyman can persuade into the decency of silence it may be urged that blast does not represent futurism but vorticism but after all, what is vorticism but futurism in an English disguise? Futurism, one might call it, bottled in England, and bottled badly. One has only to compare the pictures of the vorticists recently shown at the Goupil Gallery with the pictures of the Italian futurists which are being shown at the Dore, to see that the two groups differ from each other not in their aims, but in their degrees of competence. No one going through the gallery of Italian paintings and sculpture could fail to see that Boccioni, with all his freakishness, his hideousness, his discordant introduction of real hair, glass eyes, and so forth, into his statuary, is an artist, powerful both in imagination and in technique, his study of a woman in a balcony is of a kind to bring an added horror into a night of human sacrifices in the Congo. His representation of matter destroys the appetite like a nightmare that has escaped from the obscene bowels of the sea. It produces, one cannot deny, an emotional effect, like some loathsome and shapeless thing. Compare with it most of the work that is being done in England under futurist inspiration, and you will see the immense difference in mere power. How seldom, apart from the work of Mr. Nevinson and one or two others, one finds among the latter a picture that is more interesting to the imagination than a metal toast rack. You see a picture that looks like a badly opened sardine tin, and you discover that it is called portrait of a mother and infant you see another that looks as if someone had taken a pair of scissors and cut a union jack into squares and triangles and then had arranged the pieces at random in a patchwork quilt and this in turn is labeled say tennyson reading in memoriam to queen victoria in either case if the thing were done once it might be funny but the young artists are not content to have done it once they keep on emptying the contents of rag-bags and dust-bins onto canvases in the most wearisome way. After a time, one can neither laugh at them nor take them seriously. One can simply repeat the name of their new review with violent sincerity. It is not, however, with the futurists themselves that one's chief quarrel is. It is 
with the people who do not support the futurists but will not condemn them for fear of going down to posterity in the same boat as the people who once ridiculed wagner and the impressionists this fear of the laughter of posterity is surely the last sign of decadence it is the kind of thing that in the religious world would prevent you from criticizing the prophet dowie or mrs eddy it would compel you to take all new movements seriously simply because they were new it would lead you to suspend your judgment about the tango till you were in your grave and your grandchild could come and whisper posterity's verdict to your tombstone it is i agree a fine thing to have a hospitable mind for new things to be able to greet a wordsworth or a manet appreciatively on his first rising artists have the right to demand that their work shall be judged not according to whether it fits in with certain old standards but by its new power of affecting the emotions and the imagination great artists are continually extending the boundaries of their art and there are in the last resort no rules to judge art by except that the artist must by one means or another succeed in bringing something to life Boccioni satisfies the test in his sculpture, and therefore we must praise him, whether we like his methods or not. The majority of the futurists, on the other hand, produce no more effect of life than a diagram in Euclid, which has been crossed and blotted out with inks of various colors. Even, however, when, as in the case of the sculptures of Boccioni, and the paintings of severini we admit that a brilliant imagination is at work we are not necessarily committed to belief in the methods through which that imagination happens to express itself it is possible to enjoy whitman's poetry without believing that he has laid down the essential lines for the poetry of the future one may agree that boccioni and severini have justified their methods by results as far as they themselves are concerned this does not mean that one agrees with them when they preach the adoption of their methods by artists in general one takes the futurist movement seriously indeed only because various clever men have joined it and because young italians more than most of us seem to be justified in some form of violent reaction against the past that oppresses them whether futurism is merely the growing pains of a rejuvenated italy or whether it is a genuine manifestation of the old passion for violence which first showed itself on the day on which cain killed abel is difficult at times to say probably it is a little of both we wish says marinetti praising violence like any prussian in a famous manifesto to glory war the only health giver of the world militarism patriotism the destructive aim of the anarchist the beautiful ideas that kill the contempt for women and again we shall extol aggressive movement feverish insomnia the double quickstep the somersault the box on the ear the fisticuff it is very like mr kipling at the age of fourteen writing for a school magazine if you could imagine a kipling emancipated from religion and belief in british law and order later as marinetti proceeds to foretell the day on which the futurists shall be slain by their still more futuristic successors the schoolboy wakes once more in him and in justice strong and healthy he writes how one envies the fine flourish with which he does it will burst forth radiantly in their eyes for art can be naught but violence cruelty and injustice one need not be too solemn with writing like that it may be growing pains it may be a new jingoism of the individual but whichever it is it is amusing nonsense one begins to swear only when people above the school age insist upon taking it seriously as though it might contain a new gospel for humanity it contains no new gospel at all it is merely an entertaining restatement of an egoism of a kind that man was trying to discard before the days of bows and arrows it is a schoolboyish plea for the revival of the tomahawk 
it is a war song played in a city street on the bottom of a tin can it has no more to do with art than a display of penny fireworks an imitation of barking dogs at the calves of old gentlemen or the escapades of valentine vox it has no relation to art whatsoever except from the fact that marinetti himself is an exceedingly clever writer as one may see from almost any of his manifestos one may turn for an example of his manner to the following passage from his summons to the young to destroy the museums the libraries and the academies those cemeteries of wasted efforts those cavalries of crucified dreams those ledgers of broken attempts come then the good incendiaries with their charred fingers here they come here they come set fire to the shelves of the libraries deviate the course of canals to flood the cellars of the museums oh may the glorious canvases drift helplessly seize pickaxes and hammers sap the foundation of the venerable cities the oldest among us is thirty we have therefore ten years at least to accomplish our task when we are forty let others younger and more valiant throw us into the basket like useless manuscripts they will come against us from afar from everywhere bounding upon the lights and measure of their first poems scratching the air with their hooked fingers and scenting at the academy doors the pleasant odor of our rotting minds marked out already for the catacombs of the libraries that is a vivid piece of humor it is as amusing as marinetti's portrait of himself at the dory gallery a portrait the head of which is a clothes brush and the hat of a tobacco tin a toy which would be in its right place not at an exhibition of paintings and sculpture but in the nursery squares of mrs bland's magic city as a matter of fact however futurism as an artistic method seems to have only the slightest connection with marinetti's neo zarathustrianisms the futurist painters give us not the blood that marinetti calls for but diagrams as free from implications of bloodshed as a weather chart or the illustrations in an engineering journal these artists are not primarily concerned with protesting against the conversion of italy into a market for second-hand dealers they aim at inventing a new kind of art which shall be able to paint not objects in terms of form and color but the movements of objects and the states of mind of those who see them they have invented a jargon about simultaneousness dynamism ambiance and so forth which is about as impressive as the writings of mrs eddy and they paint in the same jargon in which they write paint the soul never mind the legs and the arms recommended the cleric and fra lippo lippi paint the simultaneousness never mind the legs and the arms is the golden rule of the futurist they have conceived a strange contempt for the visible world they tell us that a running horse has not four legs but twenty but that is no reason for leaving the horse entirely out of the picture as some of the enthusiasts do they do not realize that our sensations about horse and the movements of horse can only be painted in terms of horse that art is not a dissipation of life into wavy lines and dots and dashes but the opposite there may be a science of futurism in which the force lines of a horse or a motor car may be part of a useful diagram these arbitrary lines however have no more to do with imaginative art than the plus and minus signs in arithmetic occasionally of course there is an obvious symbolism in the lines as in the charging angles which represent the dynamism of a motor car but this is merely speed expressed by a commonplace symbol instead of by a symbolic impression of the flying car itself this is an intellectual game rather than an art occasionally it gives us a wonderful piece of broken impressionism but the stricter futurists 
are symbolistic beyond all understanding. Their work is like an allegory, to the meaning of which no one has a key. An allegory printed in the hieroglyphs of an unknown language. End of section 26「Chapter twenty seven of the Book of This and That. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Book of This and That by Robert Lind. A Defense of Critics. Mr. E. F. Benson has been attacking the critics and reviving against them the old accusations that they are merely men who have failed in the arts. There could scarcely be a more unsupported theory. As a matter of fact, to take Mr. Benson's own art, there are probably far more bad critics who end up as novelists than there are bad novelists who end up as critics. Criticism is usually the beginning, and not the decadence of a man's authorship, Young men nowadays criticize before they graduate. One becomes a critic when one puts on long trousers. It is as natural as writing poetry. Indeed, the gift seems in some ways to be related to poetry. It springs at its best from the same well of imagination. This is not to compare the art of the critic to the art of the poet in importance, but only in kind. Criticism is by its nature bound to keep closer to the earth than poetry. It has frequently more resemblance to the hedge sparrow than to the lark. It is a chatterbox of argument, not a divine spendthrift of the beauty that is above argument. It is the interpreter of an interpretation. It gives us beauty second-hand. Critics are compared somewhere to brushers of noblemen's clothes. In an honest world, however, one might brush a nobleman's clothes not out of servility, but out of tidiness. There would have been nothing degrading in it if Queen Elizabeth herself had ironed the stains out of Shakespeare's doublet, provided she had done it from decent motives. Critics of the better sort need not worry when their service is misconstrued as servitude. Those who attack them are usually men who are under the delusion that it is better to be a bad artist than a good critic. Thus we find the author of Lanky Bill and his dog Bluebeard looking down with patronage on a man like Hazlitt because he lacks something that is called the creative gift. Even the life and work of Walter Pater have not succeeded in dispelling the popular notion that the imagination is more honorably employed in inventing sentences for sawdust figures than in relating the experience of one's own soul. According to this standard, Mr. Charles Garvis must be ranked higher among imaginative authors than Sir Thomas Brown, and the essays of Elia must give place to the novels of Mrs. Florence Barclay. Clearly, no line can be drawn on principles of that kind between imaginative and unimaginative literature. The artists, for the most part, are as lacking in imagination as the critics. They have merely chosen a more luxurious form of writing. Oscar Wilde used to say that anybody could make history, but only a man of genius could write it. And one might contend in the same way that nearly anybody can make literature, but only a clever man can criticize it. The genius of the critic is as much an original gift as the genius of a runner or a composer. One need not go back further than Dryden to realize to what extent the successful artists have thrown themselves into the work of criticism. Most of us nowadays find Dryden's prefaces and his essay on dramatic poesy easier reading than his verse, and in the age that followed, criticism seems to have come as naturally to the men of letters as conversation. Addison, commonplace critic though he was, was always airing his views on poetry and music, and what is Pope's Dunciad but a comic epic of criticism? nor was Dr. Johnson less concerned with thumping the cushion in the matter of literature than in the matter of morals. His Lives of the Poets does not seem a great book to us who have been brought up on the romantic criticism of the 19th century, but it is an infinitely better book than Rosales, which has the single advantage that it is shorter. 
and so one might go on through the list of great men in letters from Johnson's to our own day. Burke, Scott, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Macaulay, Carlyle, Thackeray, Ruskin, Matthew Arnold, Swinburne, Pater, Meredith, Stevenson. I choose more or less at a hazard a list of imaginative writers who are in the very midstream of English criticism. Even in our own day, how many of the poets and novelists have graduated as critics? What lover of Mr. Henry James is there who would not almost be willing to sacrifice one of his novels rather than his partial portraits? Who is there, even among the Mr. Bernard Shaw's detractors, who would wish his dramatic criticisms unwritten? And who would not exchange a great deal of Mr. George Moore's fiction for another book like Impressions and Opinions? Similarly, Mr. W. B. Yeats has revealed his genius in a book of criticism like Ideas of Good and Evil, no less than in a book of verse like The Wind Among the Reeds. Mr. William Watson's works include a volume of Excursions in Criticism. Sir Arthur Quiller Couch has published two volumes of Critical Causeries. Mr. Max Beerbohm is no less distinguished as a critic than as a caricaturist. A.E. reviews books in the Irish Times, and Mr. Walter de la Mare in the Westminster Gazette. Here surely is a list that may suggest a doubt in the minds of those who take the view that the critics are merely a mob of embittered hacks who have failed at everything else. This is one of those traditional fallacies, like the stage Irishman, which men accept apparently for the sake of ease. Even the most superficial inquiries at the offices of the newspapers and the weekly reviews would reveal the fact that a great percentage of the best poets and novelists either are engaged or have been engaged in their green and generous days in the work of criticism. If Shakespeare were alive today, he would probably earn his living at first, not by holding horses' heads, but by turning dramatic critic. Every artist worth his salt has in him the makings of a journalist. Milton himself was as ferocious a pamphleteer as any of those blood-and-thunder rectors whom we see quoted by Sub Rosa in the Daily News. Tolstoy was as furiously active, if not so furiously bitter, a journalist. And who is the most charming and graceful journalist and critic of our own day but the charming and graceful novelist Anatole France? All this, however, is no reply to Mr. Benson's indictment of the critics on the ground that they do not discover genius, but that the public has to discover genius in spite of them. It is one of those indictments which can only be believed on the assumption that the critics are a race apart who think, as it were, au masse. Those who repeat it seem to regard the critics as a disciplined army of destruction instead of realizing that they are a hopelessly straggling company of more or less ordinary men and women of varying tastes, with a sprinkling of men and women of genius among them. They tell us that the critics attacked the Pre-Raphaelites, but they forget that Ruskin was a critic and a prophet of the Pre-Raphaelites. They tell us that the critics cold-shouldered Browning, but W. J. Fox wrote enthusiastically of Browning almost from the first, and Pater praised him in his early essays. It was a poet who, alas, was not a critic, Tennyson, who said the severest things about him. Ibsen, again, is constantly cited as an example of an artist who had to make his way to public acceptance through mobs of shrieking critics. But what do we find to be the case? In England, three of the most remarkable critics of their time, Mr. Bernard Shaw, Mr. Edmund Gosse, and Mr. William Archer, fought a desperate fight for Ibsen against almost the entire British public. The critics who attacked Ibsen did not represent the flower of British criticism, but the flower of the British public. It will be found, I believe, to be an almost invariable rule that whenever the critics have attacked men of genius, they have had the public at their back cheering them on. There are critics, indeed, who make themselves into the hired mouthpieces of the public. They long to express not what they themselves think, or they do not think, but what the public thinks. 
although it does not think. Can Mr. Benson point to any notable catch of genius ever made by critics of this kind? I do not, of course, contend that even the most intelligent reviewer in these days, who is one of the most hard-worked of journalists, is in a good position for discovering new stars of genius. No man can appreciate a Shakespeare that is thrown at his head, and books are thrown at the heads of reviewers nowadays in numbers likely to stun or bewilder rather than to evoke the mood of rapturous understanding. As for the reviewers, they are as varied a crowd as the rest of the public. One of them enjoys the Scarlet Pimpernel better than Shakespeare. Another blames Miss Marie Corelli for not writing like Dunn. Another is read and rather liked Shelley. On the whole, they are fonder of good books than most people. They have to read so many bad books as a duty that many of them ultimately get a taste for literature as a blessed relief. But, as for attacking men of genius, why, nine out of ten of them would not attack a mouse unless the prejudices of the public they reverence drove them to it. They are very nice and affable, like the gentleman in You Never Can Tell, the nicest and most affable set of human beings that ever manufactured butter outside a dairy. End of chapter 27「in a phrase Lord Goshen once used about himself, as a passionate statistician. Somehow, one did not associate statistics with Florence Nightingale. She had already taken her place in the sentimental history of the world as the angel of the wounded soldier. It is a disturbance to one's preconceptions to be asked to regard her as the angel among the blue books. As Sir Edward Cook reveals her to us, however, she is ardent in the pursuit of figures as other women in pursuit of a figure. We read how she helped one of the general secretaries of the International Statistical Congress of 1860 to draw up the program for the section dealing with the sanitary statistics, at which, indeed, her own pet scheme for uniform hospital statistics was the chief subject of discussion. Her faith in statistics, however, went far beyond that of statistical congresses, she believed that statistics were, in a measure, the voice of God. The laws of God were the laws of life, and these were ascertainable by careful and especially by statistical inquiry. That is how Sir Edward Cook explains his remark that her passion for statistics was even a religious passion. It is by no means to be wondered at that the religion of statistics made its appearance in the 19th century. The surprising thing is that no church has yet been founded in its honor. In the history of religion, philosophy, and magic, numbers have again and again played a leading part. And what are statistics but numbers on regimental parade? Pythagoras found in number the ultimate principle of creation. Xenocrates went a step further when he defined the soul as a number which moves itself. To the unphilosophical reader, the definition of Xenocrates is the merest riddle till one realizes that he was probably trying to destroy the idea that the soul was something material, a fact of space, as might be connoted by words like thing or living being. This is why, in order to express the soul, it was necessary to use an abstraction, and what so abstract as number. Nor did the numerical explanation of the universe stop here. Pure reason, Gompers tells us, in speaking of the Pythagoreans and Greek thinkers, was assimilated to unity, knowledge to duality, opinion to triplicity, sense perception to quadruplicity. What a jargon it all seems, a game of the intellect. But the heavenly arithmetic has lingered in the world to our own day, and among simple people too. 
the mystery of numbers has entered into folklore as well as into philosophy as that fine jingle green grow the rushes o oh, which survives in half a dozen english counties shows it has always seemed to me the perfect expression of the fantastic lyricism of numbers i'll sing you one o oh. green grow the rushes o oh. what is your one o oh? and so on till we reach the number twelve in the catalogue of holy delights twelve are the twelve apostles eleven eleven went up to heaven ten are the ten commandments nine are the bright shiners eight are the bold rainers seven seven are the stars in heaven six are the proud walkers five are the symbols at your door four are the gospel makers three three is the rivals two two is the lily white boys clothed all in green o oh. one is one and all alone and evermore shall be so what it all means is for the folklorist to dispute about it is interesting in the present connection chiefly as the ruins of an arithmetical statement of the mysteries of the universe similar chants of numbers are known in all religions they are common to christianity mohammedanism and judaism one is told that on the night of the passover jewish families chant a list of numbers beginning who knoweth one and going on to who knoweth thirteen with its answer i saith israel know thirteen thirteen divine attributes twelve tribes eleven stars ten commandments nine months preceding childbirth eight days preceding circumcision seven days of the week six books of the mishnah five books of the law four matrons three patriarchs two tables of the covenant but one is our god who is over the heavens and the earth this list may be regarded as a mere aid to memory and no doubt it is to some extent that but it is also an example of the religious use of numbers a use which has given various numbers of magic significance one has an example of this magic significance in the custom among those who resort to holy wells of walking around the well nine times in the opposite direction to the sun one always has to do things by threes or sevens or nines similarly the belief in the maleficent power of thirteen is commoner in london than in patagonia where indeed they do not know how to count up to thirteen one remembers too how in recent years the prophetic sort of evangelical christians were on the lookout for some great statesman or conqueror upon whom they could fix the dreaded number of the antichrist six 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 first it was napoleon later it was gladstone the letters of whose name if you slightly misspelt it in greek stood for numbers which added up to the awful total i recall the relief with which in my own childhood i discovered the fact that however wrongly my name was spelt and in whatever language it was not possible to work out 666 as the answer so much for the mysteries of numbers to most people the whole thing will appear a chronicle of superstitions as astrology does but just as astronomy has taken the place of the superstitions of the stars so statistics has taken the place of the superstitions of numbers it is as though men had suspected all along that stars and numbers had some significance beyond their immediate use in beauty but for hundreds of years they could only guess what it was it was not till the eighteenth century indeed that the science of statistics was discovered under its present name at least and ever since then men have been debating whether it is a science or only a method whichever you prefer to call it it may be described as an explanation of human society in terms of number it is the discovery of the most efficient symbols that have yet been invented for the realistic portraiture of men in the mass symbols i say advisedly for statistics is more closely allied to oriental than to western art in that it avoids the direct imitation of life and appeals to the imagination through conventional figures perhaps it is a certain suspicion of orientalism that accounts for the fanatical hatred of statistics which still exists among many of the apostles of the west for statistics is a new thing which has had to fight as desperately for recognition as impressionist art or wagnerian opera infuriated victorians still speak of lies damn lies and statistics as the three degrees of wickedness 
and the statistician is denounced in superlatives as a sort of jailer of humanity who would give us all numbers instead of names now i'm not concerned to defend bad statisticians any more than bad artists statistics has its charlatans its bounders after a new thing as well as its da vinci's and its michelangelo's or perhaps it is more comparable to music than to painting or sculpture the philosophy of number is the philosophy of proportion of harmony of rhythm and statistics is the study of the proportions harmonies rhythms of society music and poetry it should be remembered are both an affair of number i lisped in numbers said the poet for the numbers came and the statistician has the same apology statistics of course is largely concerned like the arts with the disharmonies of life but it deals with them in terms of harmony it is a method of asserting order amid chaos and that is why the lovers of chaos attempt to spread the idea among the people that statistics is a dangerous innovation a black-coated tyranny that is why landlords who benefit by the social chaos have fought so hard against the valuation of land and churches against the registration of ecclesiastical property similarly there was a middle-class party that denounced the income tax because it would mean a statistical inquest into the wealth of manufacturers and shopkeepers among savage tribes we are told it is a common custom to hide one's name because those who know one's name have a magic power over one's soul similarly in civilized societies the rich man likes to hide his number he knows that in some way the knowledge of this will give society a new control over him it is possible to ignore all the evils of monopolized riches till one knows the numbers of the rich to many people it is a turning point in social and political belief to discover such a fact as that of the total income of great britain in ireland in nineteen o eight five million five hundred thousand people received nine hundred and nine million pounds while thirty nine million people received nine hundred and thirty five million pounds in other words the fact that one half of the wealth of great britain and ireland goes to the twelve per cent of the population who belong to the class with incomes over a hundred and sixty pounds a year it is a terrible revelation both of poverty and of riches the figures thunder at one's imagination more effectively than a sea of rhetoric and the figures concerning destitution and the housing of the poor are still more terrible in their realism shelley never wrote a revolutionary hymn that more surely prophesied the coming of a new society social greed that has withstood ten thousand prophets and poets at last begins to feel troubled in the unaccustomed presence of the statistician not the statistician in his study of course he is no more than a dry-as-dust inventor but the statistician like florence nightingale with the genius of a fine purpose and a sure aim with sure facts this is not to discredit any of the old battalions of reform it is merely to hail the coming of the new regiment of the statisticians who fight with tables instead of swords and whose leaders exhort them on the eve of battle with passages out of blue books statistics and the man i sing let the next great epic be an arithmiad end of chapter twenty eight end of the book of this and that by robert lind